For today's show, I want to give you some ideas on how to rise above, and I want to give you some examples about uh, going to college and my experience going to college and also my experience with taking a, a recent class at Yale University. So number one, I think it's extremely important to get a goal. Very important. And number two, I think we have to realize that life is difficult. Once we understand that life is difficult, it becomes easier because we should expect a lot of negativity and bad things to happen and there's a lot of challenges out there and we, we can't act like this stuff doesn't happen. As a matter of fact, if we understand that life is difficult, we actually look forward to the difficulty and I think that's a, um, a good way to be successful. Number three, very important, we need to take full and complete responsibility for our lives. And with that comes trying to make the correct choices and decisions in your life. But in saying that, I also want to acknowledge and I want to validate people out there that have been born with a plastic spoon in their mouth, so to speak, and not a silver spoon. Making correct choices and decisions is much more difficult if you come from a disadvantaged background and it's much more difficult if you come from a very negative socioeconomic background. And because you may not have agency and because your environment has put you in a situation where you don't see a lot of success and you may not feel like you have any power, your self-esteem may be low. And that's okay, we can work through that as long as we have the goal, as long as we understand that life is difficult and understand that you're still responsible for your choices and your decisions. Now, the extra responsibility here is gonna be on you because you don't have the opportunity to make that many mistakes. A person who's born with a silver spoon in their mouth can make many mistakes over and over and it may not affect their life that negatively. So we have to take that into consideration. So we start the race where we start. If we start the race 20 yards behind the starting line, that's okay. That's the way life is sometimes with some people. We can't cry and complain about it. We just have to do our job, make the correct decisions, make the correct choices, and try to tilt the table as much in, in favor of you. And don't worry about the rest of the world. So how do we do this? I believe, and I would hope you would consider that the number one quality and the trait that you need is called grit. You need to be gritty. What is grit? By definition, it's perseverance over time. And as Nietzsche would say, it's a religious dedication in the same direction for as long as it takes to get to your goal. And if you have that, your chance of success is going to increase a lot. So today I want to give you an example uh, of something that I just did recently. Uh, after all these years, I finally did, uh, I went to a class, I took a class at Yale University. And I was expecting this because it's an Ivy League school that it's so difficult to pass a class because it's probably in the top two, maybe three, maybe the number one most prestigious college in the world. So this is my experience with the class. It's a 10 week course. I put in about three days worth of work on this and about an hour to an hour and a half each day. And so let's say tops five hours of work I did. And in that five hours of work, I completed 10 weeks worth of a Yale course. It was probably one of the easiest classes I've ever taken. And one of the reasons is, is because I actually had the information in front of me. Previous, when I had no money, way back when, when I went to college, I actually saved money by not buying any books. And this time I actually had information in front of me and it was as easy as easy can be. Um, I learned some things, but on the other hand, most of the, the studying that I do on my own on a regular basis, I already had this. So, this is where some people say the college is not worth it because the education that you can get in college now, it's available to you online. 
And this is true. And I'm a definite believer of this as well. But here's the other point about it, is that you don't necessarily go to school to get an education. You go to school to get credentialed. So in my position, I want to be a licensed marriage and family therapist, of which I am. It doesn't matter how much knowledge I have. I need to be credentialed. I need to have the letters behind my name. And so here you see it in this particular class, which most of it was centered around Martin Seligman's positive psychology, which of course I've been studying on my own for about 10 years. So I just kind of went through their coursework and I took the classes, uh, I mean, the, the tests, and I got 100 on everything. I didn't get anything wrong. I didn't expect to. I mean, that's not bragging. It's just, and this is one of the reasons why I'm doing this show today, because I've been doing a lot of therapy on some young people that are now getting to the age where they're seniors and they are looking at schools and they come from very disadvantaged backgrounds and they feel like they're not good enough to get into a good school. And I'm going to tell you that and it doesn't matter. Just get your feet on the ground. As a matter of fact, don't. Just get a seat in the classroom. You'll be fine then just let your grit take you the rest of the way. I can say without a doubt from what I've seen and my experience that Ivy League schools are not more difficult than any other school. Here's the difference. They're hard to get into. It's not the classwork that's hard. It's hard to get into them and they're hard to pay for. So here are some facts. Now, I took the class from Yale. But some of these facts that I'm looking at are from Harvard because they were sued because of their nepotism. So a lot of this information you can't get on other schools, but you can get it about Harvard because the information was released because they got sued. So here's an interesting fact. 50% of white students that go to Harvard are admitted on their merit. That's interesting, right? Because that means that 43% of white students that go to Yale or Harvard, let's say, didn't get there on merit. They got there because they're the children of some staff members that work for the school. They got there because mommy and daddy donate money to the school. They got there because somebody in their family had gone to the school or on the off case, somebody might be an athlete. And that's really it. Now, out of those four categories that I mentioned, 75% of those students that were admitted because of those four categories, they would have been rejected from that school or any other Ivy League school or most Division I schools. So what does that tell us? It tells us that life is difficult, right? Because if you don't have that kind of financial background, you're probably not gonna get into that school. And you may feel that you don't have what it takes to get there, intelligence-wise. But I don't think that's true. I don't believe in equality of outcome at all, zero. But I do believe in equality of opportunity. And this is one of the major things of my life that I've been told not to talk about from a lot of people because they don't want to hear it. But even when we look at merit, what does merit mean? What should merit mean? America is supposed to be a meritocracy. You get what you put into it. When you work hard, you get what you deserve. If two people are vying for the same position, the person who wins or is more skillful or better, they get the position. But meritocracy is not exactly what we all might hope that it is, because it's not. Let me give you an example of a meritocracy. When I went to school a long time ago, I went to one school from kindergarten through second grade. And in that school, I don't know, I liked it. I thought it was a pretty good school. But we didn't learn a thing about music, nothing. Uh, nothing about half notes, whole notes, rests, nothing. I, I didn't even know what if there was a... A, B, C, notes, nothing. Uh, we had moved, we went to a new school. In this school in third grade, there was limited amount of instruments. And so they had a, uh, an assembly where they would play some instruments and the students were allowed to put in their top three instruments that they wanted to play. 
And I came home, I was so excited, I wanted to play the violin. You have no idea how much I wanted to do this. I thought it was gonna be so fun. I put in for two other instruments, I'm not sure what they were. And so you had to earn your right to be able to play an instrument and to be in the band because, through merit. And it was done what they would call fairly because we had a music test and the top scores, you would be able to get an instrument and you could now be in band. Well, I didn't know anything about music. I had never taken a music class before. So where, how is the merit in there fair? It's not. So I don't even know what I got, but I certainly didn't end up in near the top and I was not allowed to have an instrument. I was not allowed to be in band. I was not allowed to participate in any of those things. And so I just thought that there was something wrong with me, that, you know, that there wasn't one person that thought that I had the aptitude to do it. Not one teacher thought to ask if I had ever taken a class on music before, even though I was the new kid at school. So just to fast forward this a little bit, when I was uh, 25 years old and I moved to Las Vegas and I was doing well, one of the first things I bought myself, even before, before I bought myself a couch or before I bought even, you know, I don't know, silverware, is that I went into a local music store and I bought myself a Fender Stratocaster guitar with an amp because I can play and I'm actually not that bad, but I was never given the chance. So if you ask me, Am I successful? I'm going to tell you yes. But then if you ask me why I still have an axe to grind sometimes, it's because I understand that there's a lot of people out there that come from backgrounds where they were told that they couldn't do things. And yet they can. And there's people out there that get things handed to them on a silver platter all the time. And there, it's not true meritocracy. There has to be somebody out there that is going to help the unfortunate or the underprivileged move up the ladder. And so that's part of what I'm go going to talk about. So in order to get into an Ivy League school, one of the things that's interesting is, is that the average student comes from a family who has a median income of $200,000, which is really interesting because I think, what is it now? Four out of five families in America live paycheck to paycheck. We actually think as a country that we're doing the best we can when there's 80% of the people who really have almost no chance of getting into a good school, only that the rich get richer. That makes no sense to me. It actually should make sense to anybody unless of course you were afraid of competition and you were at the top and you just didn't want your, your kids to go up against anybody else. So that's the way I see that. So let's talk about uh, nepotism. Nepotism is when you can get into the school or get some other things in life, where, whatever it might be that you're looking for, through your family connections. And this happens in business all the time. By the way, a white person, uh, in order for them to get admitted into an Ivy League school, it increases by 700% if their family donates money. So, you know, there's that too. But what's nepotism actually? It's the conservative justification of affirmative action for white people. So we do talk about how affirmative action is negative and it's, and it's bad and it's, you, know, you don't want to give anybody anything because it lowers their self-esteem. But we talk about that for the disadvantaged. You know, why do we have nepotism and affirmative action for the rich then? Doesn't it kill their self-esteem? I would say it does, but I guess it doesn't matter that much if they're successful, right? So if you are in a position where you do want to go to college, now I do understand that there's a lot of conservatives out there now, about 60% last time I looked, that believe that college is a waste of time and it's actually dangerous. And that's okay. I, I totally support you know, people's decisions and their way of thinking. But let's look at uh, two interesting facts here. If a person actually does get a bachelor's degree or four years degree, over a period of their working lifetime, 
on average, they get paid $900,000 more throughout their life than somebody who doesn't have a degree. So that's one interesting fact. Here's another one. If you have a six-year degree or a master's degree, typically they make on average $1.4 million more than another person who does not have that degree. So if you feel that $900,000 or one point something million dollars is a lot of extra money, then consider the thought that college might be a thing for you. And if college is not for you, just develop a trade or a skill, I would have you consider that. But of course, I don't make decisions for other people. But let's take the facts into consideration here. So if you're going to compete against other people for college, and I did, I'm going to give you some of my examples here. Here's some of the things that you're going to have to contend with. And again, life is difficult, so this actually becomes fun. They're probably going to have a better K-12 through program than you went through. It's not a big deal. They may have better role models than you, better contacts than you for money and jobs. They may be in a better environment than you. And more money, of course, which can lead to, if, if someone's having difficulty, they could have gotten tutors throughout their life. They probably could get better books than you. And with the money, they could have more college opportunities than you as well. Also, with the extra money, it means that they can study more and work less. So that's some of the things that you'll have to overcome if you want to compete against somebody else. But that's okay. You should like work. Listen, I started work as a busboy at 12 years old. Now, don't let anybody tell you that um, child labor laws are gone. Because <laughs> I was working at 12. And I was working for the big price of, I think it was $1.50 an hour. You couldn't complain about that because we were all illegal. <laughs> so, yeah, and I actually enjoyed it, by the way. So, and that, you know, it taught me that you have to work for what you want in life. Let's fast forward. When you are, I think it's, I was a senior and you would have like the college fair and you're walking around and there's all these other colleges that you can go to. It was ridiculous for me. It's like a diabetic walking around and looking at a dessert menu. I couldn't have any of that. It was a big waste of time for me. All I did was look at all these colleges and brochures. It's like looking at travel guides of all places I would never go. And I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, the SAT, I never took it. Didn't feel like I need to because I knew I wasn't going to have access into one of these Division I type schools. So it's like, why bother? The SAT costed money. Uh, the certain kids had the SAT preparation classes every weekend or whatever it was. Didn't care. I knew that that was not the road for me. And I needed money for school. So what did I do? So like in June of 83, I skipped my prom, which is a way to save money. And back then, a Division I school, even in 1983, was between ten to $15,000 a year. But the family that I came from, the total income was at below poverty level, which back then was at about $9,000 a year. So I come from a household where household income was $9,000 a year, and a college would cost ten to 15000 So the math does not add up. So I went to Nassau Community College, which I thought was a really good school, by the way, and it cost me $900 a year. But I was able to actually pay for it. And one of the decisions I made when I started to school, go to school is a decision I had made many years before that. It was I was not going to spend a penny on drinks, alcohol, nothing like that, even though people go to school to party. That wasn't me. But the other thing I did was that I never bought a book. I went to school for four years. I got my bachelor degree. I've got a master's degree now, but in the first four years, I had never bought a book, except for one. And I needed to buy a math book, because that's where the math problems came from. I, I couldn't get around that. All the other classes, I could either really listen really hard in class and write good notes, and I can go to the library and pick up some information or some information that I already had because I read all the time. So I pretty much did it off the top of my head. 
So that's why when I say that Yale is a really easy school to pass a class in, it's because now that I actually have the resources, I actually went through the first four years of school with no resources. Again, if you consider a one book a resource, then yeah, good. Then I went to Adelphi University, which was actually a pretty good school. Uh, if I remember correctly, at that time, the tuition was over $3,000 a year, which was very, very expensive for me. Um, I did get some help. Uh, I, I did take out a loan. But here's the interesting part of what I keep saying is you need a religious dedication in the same direction for as long of a time as it takes. Is that it took me seven years to get through a four-year school because I would go for a semester or a year and then I would take off and I would work full-time. Now somebody might say, well, why, why would it still take you so long? Let's put it in perspective. Back then when I was working and going to school, the minimum wage was $3.35 an hour. My skill level was nothing. So I was making like $3 an hour. Now when you work 40 hours a week, that's only $120 a week. I'm making $500 a month. That's $6,000 a year. Like that's not a lot of money when these schools are that expensive. That's why people on the low socioeconomic situation, they have a long, hard road to get even with some of these other people. But I am here to tell you that if school is your thing, and this is what you want to do, I would keep taking those steps, one step at a time. I don't care how long it takes. Because here's the truth. In the end, it's the classic hare versus the tortoise. The tortoise is slow, but the tortoise will always win. Because in the end, when you get your four-year degree, your diploma, on it says the school that you graduated from. It does not say the school that you started from if it's a community college. There is no shame in going to a community college. Nobody cares where you start. They care where you finish. And so if you want to think about choices and decisions, consider that one. Also, let me say this. There are a lot of employers out there that are very, very intelligent, caring, compassionate people. And they do look into the resume a little bit more than you might think. On my first real resume. I had, uh, this was back in the day, so they actually had people to help you with this kind of stuff. You didn't just do it online. We didn't have online. But the, the woman that I was working with, she asked me if I had paid for my own school. And I said, yeah, but I didn't think that was a big deal. That's just kind of what you do. And she said, no, that's actually, you're on the minority. Not too many people go through all those years of school paying for themselves. So she put it down because it's a separator from these other people that have mommy and daddy paying for their, their school. And what happened was almost immediately, I had some really good job prospects in New York City. Most of it based off of the fact that they thought that I was mentally strong. And so there you have it. If I was going to put this all together, handling your adversity is paramount. There are people out there that appreciate that. And you have to enjoy the tough times because the tough times don't last. But if you're tough, you will last and people will appreciate it and you will, in the end, rise above. So thanks for listening to today's show. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to help me out, you can subscribe and tell a friend. Thank you.